Welcome. Uh, today we begin uh, sort of wrapping everything up. Um, uh, important reflection this week. But first, let's see. Uh, do we have any guests with us today? Yeah. My name is Cecilia Maria. I was um, doing the MPID um, last year, yeah. and I'm currently in Cambridge, and I guess I'm the oldest as well. Oh, okay. Well, another guess. Uh, how about an album? Any announcement? So is that able? Yeah. <laughs> 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 this is set to the worst sweatpants brother, every day. Huh? <laughs> and then like surprise everybody. Uh, so I uh, just wanted to make a second announcement about the reflection book. Uh, we're gonna send that email out today. That email will have a link to a, a, a Google Doc for you to upload pictures to, and also a Google survey for you to upload all your quotes and, uh, and, and different things to. So please get to it. Uh, we really need all your feedback to make this reflection book uh, happen. And we're going to all be able to take these memories with us once we go. So that's going to go out today. And so please, uh, you're going to have until uh, midnight next Wednesday to be able to turn everything in. So I uh, just want to make that announcement for you all. Other, other announcements, uh, things people would like to share? Yeah, Nick? Um, if anyone's around on Thursday from 5 to 7, um, a bunch of the workers who are leaders at the hotel and students who are involved slash interested in the campaign were having a picnic from 5 to 7. Um, it was going to be a barbecue, but then we like didn't have a barbecue. Um, <laughs> so it's going to be just out there in JLK Park. So like 5 to 7, feel free to just drop in and say hi to a worker or, or like one of the other students. Um, if you can bring something to eat or drink, that'd be cool. If not, that's fine. Yeah, and is anyone here on the Kennedy School of Student Government? No. Yeah. Just take oh. Oh. Hmm. Oh, that is, no. Okay. Other, uh, yeah. Uh, so there's an event at the Ed School next Tuesday that is 29th April from 6 p.m. to 9 p.m. It's about how education offers opportunities <coughs> against sexual violence prevention. So more about what can be positive reinforcements to prevent, even before preventive sexual violence, against sexual violence. So please come, all, everybody is welcome. It's, it's at the Ed School, but it's open to all Harvard schools. This is my organizing project. Great, good luck. Other, other, yeah. Um, next Wednesday, April 30th, from 10.30 to 12, it's got this.
to take away from this class. And something that was very telling was um, that I got asked by team members to be the timekeeper for the event, and that was my main responsibility. So had I not been there, guys, it would have been <laughs> So it was really, it was for me. It was very symbolic because it was just like keeping pace with the event. But had I not been there, everything would have been fine. And and I think that's a very important leadership um, lesson. And so uh, I think the people that were on the leadership team had a chance to shine throughout the event. They had a chance to speak at different points in the conference. And in the end, uh, a person who I um, hope will be perhaps take on more of a leadership role in the future, he gave the closing statements and he, it was called a call to action and we already have an organizing team for next year. So, it was, it was good. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. So, when you're being asked to be the time keeper, that's when you know everything. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's great. That's really good. Any other, uh, anything else that you would like to share? <laughs> okay. Um, so a few logistical announcements. Um, so this week is the last section meeting on Thursday. Um, and it's going to include an evaluation um, you know, of, of your section and how things work and so forth there. Um, so you know, think about that a bit. Um, and uh, the evaluation we're going to do as a class, or the whole class will be next week here uh, with everyone. Uh, on reflection papers, uh, this is a um, uh, required reflection paper this, this week, this last one. Um, and it's, it's the focus on what this week is a focus on, which is the practice of organizing, like what it means to do this, what it takes to do this kind of work, to exercise leadership in this, in this way. And so the reflection paper is uh, about what you've learned about yourself uh, with respect to this work of organizing and leadership, um, what it takes to what you what you learned about what it takes to do it well, uh, and what kind of support you might need to continue learning, um, and how you might apply uh, tools that you've acquired uh, to your future calling, whether it's a professional organizer or not, but different ways that you think these tools might be useful. Um, so that's, uh, that's the focus for the reflection paper uh, this week. Uh, now we passed out um, about final papers. There's a handout here, I just want to go over. So the final paper is, uh, is due 5 o'clock um, Boston time. <laughs> okay, good. Uh, on Friday, May 9th. Um, and I'll just read the purpose of the final papers to give you an opportunity to critically evaluate your experience of your project, the learning framework used in the class, what you learned about yourself as a reflective practitioner. And in a sense, it's an extended reflection paper uh, in the sense that um, there's, there's sort of three different angles on this. There's, there's yourself, your own learning, your own, uh, 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 you know, your own takeaways, your own understanding, as uh, in terms of your own practice of leadership and how you learn. Uh, there's the conceptual framework that we've been using to uh, focus this effort. Uh, and then there's the project itself and uh, what, the, what, what the learning is connected with that. And so there's, all, there's these three dimensions involved. And you may want to focus on all three. You may want to take one that's particularly important. Um, but they all interact. I mean, that's sort of at the heart of the reflective practice that we've been trying to teach, is about one's own self-awareness, about the conceptual framework that one's using, and then about the, the way that or organizes, or not, real-world experience so that we can become more effective in the real world, which is what, what it's all about. And so then we have some ideas, suggestions here about uh, looking back over your reflection papers, look for common themes, ideas. This is not about pasting reflection papers together. That won't work. Uh, look over the syllabus. Um, uh, think about readings that are related to your project. Uh, change your thinking. Made arguments that did or didn't seem to be consistent with your experience. Think about what you might do differently if you were to start a project from the beginning again or do a similar project. This is, none of this is like do this. This is just some uh, things to provoke thinking about how you might think about using uh, the paper. 
um, then what the paper does, it makes an argument. So again, this is not a this is not a descriptive paper. It's analytic. It's making a claim uh, about uh, what you learned or about uh, what the challenge was and what you took away from it. Um, a pretty clear, concise statement at the beginning, this is what I'm going to argue in this paper. And these are the three things I'm going to argue. It really helps to focus things. And I say argue, I don't mean, uh, I don't mean to uh, fight, but I mean to make an argument that is claims supported by evidence uh, and logic. Uh, use specific and detailed examples of your work this semester in your project. Uh, use the concepts and arguments from lectures, reading, whatever. This is not about demonstrating you did all the reading. If there's, uh, if there's readings that are relevant, use them. Uh, if there's lectures that are relevant, use them. Uh, and it's helpful if you, if you section, if you have, if it has sections to hit, put headings on the sections. Just it's easier to grasp and read, more focused. Uh, the final paper is not a sum of your weekly reflection papers, a simple narrative of your project, or a discussion of what you will do in the future. Um, the, the, future the trouble with future discussion is that they sort of go off into space. That's not to say that you, when you're writing, you wouldn't say, so based on what I learned this semester, this is how I think about doing this in the future. That's fine. It's just to go off into sort of an imagined world is not, not really the, the idea. Um, papers will be graded on a standard letter grade scale to 30% of your grade for the course. Um, you'll recall that if, uh, if they're an improvement over the midterm, they'll bring up the midterm grade. Otherwise, the midterm grade uh, stands. Don't need to reference any other readings. Uh, seven pages of text, double spaced with 12 point font and one inch margins, please. Um, number your pages. And if you go over seven pages, uh, it will cost you in terms of grade. Um, images go over, um, images don't count. So we like images. Okay. So Wednesday, um, now, oh yeah, last thing. Uh, if you want to get some feedback on what you're thinking about writing about, um, you can write up a paragraph. This is what I'm thinking of doing in this paper. And if you provide it to your TF by Wednesday, April 30th at midnight, uh, uh, then we'll get it back to you by, what do we say? Saturday. Saturday at noon, yeah. So if you, if you want to give it some thought, write up some notions, uh, submit it to your TF, they'll give you feedback on, on that schedule. Any questions about this? The other thing I want to say, John, what I said about other papers is that um, use it to tackle something you're struggling with. I mean, uh, something you haven't figured out, it, it'll probably be more productive, probably a better paper too. You know. So, I mean, try to use the, the occasion of writing a paper like this to do some learning. Uh, it'll be much useful that way. Yeah, um, I remember in one of the first classes, we read two uh, pages from like last year's class, two different organizing projects. Should we look at those as potential like, models for the final paper, or was that something? No, those were just, those were just um, cases written up specifically to show what a project is, yeah. but not, not, they weren't reflection papers, no. Other, other questions? Okay, um, so in terms of the rest, what we're going to focus on today, does everybody have Jonah's little journey here? This was from two before last. Uh, I think we passed out Jonah's thing on strategy before. And uh, Jonah's one of these guys that, that can take notes on meetings by drawing pictures. I don't know if you've ever seen that, that sort of graphic note taking. It's really extraordinary. So anyway, this is his rendition of, uh, of the journey here. Um, and of course, the journey has been in exploring what leadership practiced as organizing means, what it's about, uh, how does it work. Uh, what's involved in it. Uh, and uh, he sort of tracks us through the beginning of this journey with story, and then moving to relationships. Um, and then, now that they're happily joined there, they're happily they're in relationship. Uh, now, they seem to have reversed strategy and structure, because we did structure first, but I guess they're eager to get right to strategy, so there they are. Uh, and then structure and you recognize some of the elements there. 
uh, and then action. Uh, and of course, there's a peak event there at the end and a contrast between things as they ought to be as opposed to things as they were. Anyway, uh, that's kind of the journey that we've been on, is exploring each of those different uh, tools, how they fit together, uh, then in the end, uh, uh, looking in terms of cases and your projects. So the question today really is, so what's your takeaway in terms of what are your takeaways in terms of what doing this work well is about? Um, what have you learned about that? Um, you know, you've had a semester of experience with us. Uh, what do you think it takes to, to do this, to exercise this kind of leadership effectively? Um, what's most challenging about it and how can you deal with those challenges? And you're experts on this now. Mona. Unfortunately, um, I think that the main thing that has realized is that we are the problem. Something is bad out there, it's not because there are bad people. There, of course, there are some bad people. Um, <laughs> I was wondering where this place is. But, yeah. <laughs> but I think that it is our problem. We don't, uh, we don't have agency, and we, when we do, we don't want to uh, uh, with each other um, and uh, when we do and the opportunity comes out we start to have these very silly uh, trivial uh, disagreements that could blow up the whole thing so for no reason I mean uh, it's, it's very interesting uh, to, to watch it and um, so why is that bad news why it's, good, you it's good news to, to, to know that I mean good news to know that it is the main thing is about relationships, actually. And it's about uh, managing own self and, and see what I'm doing and be really mindful of what I'm doing and purposeful of what I'm, I'm, I'm dealing with people, how am I dealing with them, uh, what I'm telling them, what I'm uh, listening to them. Be purposeful about the whole thing and to be serious about changing it, really, really serious. So, so what have you learned about how to do that? Or anybody? I mean, one just put a challenge out there. She's saying, you want to change the world, you got to focus on yourself first. There's a lot of wisdom in that. Uh, you know, because while challenging, it's also uh, <coughs> constructive. I mean, because maybe we don't control the whole world, but we have a little more to do with ourselves. Yeah, okay. Um, I think for me, uh, an amazing and like life-changing shift was actually uh, listening, like learning how to listen and knowing that the answer really lies within teams. And I think here it's outlined quite beautifully in, in this class where it's a person that begins alone, but then there's people and that get harnessed and you know, and, and then there's a team and then there's action. And so I think if people learn to listen to themselves, but, but, like uh, to the group better, and build off of what other people say and push that forward. Um, I think that's really where the organizing change begins. Have you found ways to do that? Asking questions and not giving so many, and not thinking I have the answers, but really like ask, learning how to ask questions. And I think it's also about uh, being true, tr trying to understand who we are and look at our, you know, where we can improve, and if we have arrogance, and I know I, I have a level of that, trying to be conscious of it and trying to make ourselves better for the group and for what we want to do. Well, so what other people think about this? I'm starting off by a lot of self-reflection there on the kinds of things we need to do. Of course, sometimes the thing with these things is they're, they're, they're they're easy to describe, but they're pretty challenging to do. And so part of it is how to actually turn this into practice, make it make it real. I think it's one of the big challenges. Yeah. I think I've gotten checked a few times, like over the past few weeks, around like how are we going to do this? Like empowerment, you know, power at the margins. Like there is power there, and that like organizing around creating opportunities for where people already feel powerful. Understanding where you are to feel powerful. So, like, making it less about like, my own comfort. Do you think 
something specific? Yeah, like I'm, I'm very comfortable like, talking to large groups and like, you know, that sort of thing, and other people aren't necessarily, or like, they have a lot more facility with, um, I think like bringing in scholarship or research and things like that. And like I was thinking it much more about like this is how I frame the strategy around what we're doing or sort of like organizing people around this. So like just sort of really activating what people are good at and allowing like their sort of like advantage to like drive the sort of mobilization of sort of looking for the assets that are there from which to build, yeah. rather than focusing so much on the deficit. Yeah. You know, which sometimes takes us in a very good, if I understand what you're saying, but sort of, I guess also like seeing what an asset can be. Yeah. Uh, that's interesting, good, yeah. Do you want to like ask a question slash offer a contest to that? And good. Thinking out loud. Um, is that, on the one hand, I think it's very important to take yourself out of it, but on the other hand, to model what it means to, for that agency that you were talking about to do that sort of thing. Um, and kind of, I've been asking myself a lot of questions about where you need to model, and not even give an answer, but yeah, put something there, and when you need to create the space to let the other people bring yeah. it, and where that does and where that is. What do you think about that? Um, I feel like I'm still at the beginning of my project, and I'm tremendously struggling with that. Um, especially, yeah, I don't know, especially because I'm walking out of the group as they're still developing, and I'm kind of, I envision that I can leave and they can do this by themselves, and they're yeah. like, no, you, <laughs> we need some, not necessarily me, but we need a leader who's going to hold that space, um, and that's, that's a question that I wonder about, uh, I wonder about, and I would, yeah, if there's anyone stop on that, I'm just thinking, oh, everyone can facilitate a different piece, and they can build a structure together because they all care, but until I came and said, want to do something, they all wanted to, and they'll have it within them. They have the power, and I think they know that, but they need something, or they feel like they need something or someone to help them bring it out. Well, it's, a, it's a very well put. I mean, I think it is very challenging, what you just described. Yeah, I don't think there's that. Yeah. I also like, um, in terms of the relationship with other people, the concept that I was reading about the allies versus confidants, because I definitely found myself wearing that line. Project and I think it's important to acknowledge when you have moments of self-doubt, but I sometimes project that onto the group, which I don't think is necessarily helpful. So I, it wasn't until I actually read that that I was like, oh, that's what I've been doing. <laughs> think about that a little bit more. But I think that's, it gets back to some of the um, the personal versus professional relationships, I think, which is also something I kept coming back to. Yeah, that's a great point. Uh, one of the hardest things is when you're, <coughs> you are feeling anxious to not project that on everybody else, and so then you got a whole bunch of anxious people instead of just one. And sort of how you manage that to be there in such a way that you're moving it in a different way. I think that's one of the really challenging pieces, I think, you know, when it comes to self management and leadership and modeling and all the rest of it. So, is there a point of it? No. Yeah. What, what else about this? I mean, this, I don't know if anybody's got your thing figured out. No, because I mean, the, you know, the, there there are folks that you know want to take the initiative, and, and, and there's there's spark, and well, we call it the bright eyes or whatever. I mean, there's sort of like you're looking for people. Uh, I think all the time, but yeah, Julie. Um, I was gonna mention just the idea that when we first were sort of starting class, and we were all talking about like, the fear of like starting how that fear kind of keeps creeping up yeah. in the sense that I feel like whenever I'm about to sort of, you know, do the next mini peak, like I also have to sort of like grapple with like the fear of like asking people to do more or um, or sort of, you know, making a certain suggestion or sort of, um, you know, thinking about it within, within a certain framework. But it, it, it's sort of like that fear is kind of constantly creeping up towards like there was one, one point where I felt like we were snowflaking pretty well Whereas like now it's like I kind of feel like I'm almost in like back to that mode and I'm trying to like get back to play, play the snowflake mode. So <laughs> just like realizing that the, the battle, like the internal battle for me is like in constant in a way that um, I guess I didn't anticipate at the beginning. And how, you know, putting the stuff in the rest of the day, just how our folks kind of through their team like kind of got the energy and sort of perspective that they needed to kind of do. Yeah. Yeah. Is this 
this sound familiar with Julian's talking about? Very familiar. Somebody got it figured out. No, I, because, but I mean, I think what's so wise about this is, is to appreciate that, yes, this happens. So how do you build in structures or relationships that move you through it? Because you're not going to be suddenly a perfect person. Uh, so so how, how to organize things to catch, to catch so that's there for you to, to, to sustain you, to enable you, I, I think, so that it becomes a question of strat strategy, too. How do I how do I strategize to anticipate that this will happen and be able to go through it? You said one thing about about the role of teams, which certainly can be that. But over here, yeah, another. Yeah, I guess just going back to like the last couple of comments. I mean, yeah, I think from the beginning, my main struggle has largely revolved around like having such apprehension about becoming a dot that I like didn't step up to the plate until kind of fairly late in the game. And I think uh -huh. the big lesson for me from that was that. Even if you have identified that they have these shared values and they already care about these issues, like what you know, what's my, like what am I bringing to the table is a question I think that we we grappled with before, and and I think, you know, I, I was able to get over a stalemate in my own project when when I got overcame my own fear about like stepping into the spotlight a little bit to specifically present like a very concrete idea and objective that we could come together around, and that that was actually what like helped us move forward and helped me start to see other people stepping up in different ways because I like I put something on the table. And, and specifically, it was envisioning like the peak event. Like we never had that conversation. And initially, I was like, let's have a leader leadership team. And like, you know, no one really knew where it was going or what I was talking about. It was very abstract. But I think when, when you set specific parameters, whether it's around time or action or whatever, like you can start to see people moving in different ways that you, you know, might not have expected. So, so now it's, I think, a matter of maintaining that balance which is, you know, still an ongoing struggle, but I realized that, like, I needed to, I had something of value to contribute, and I don't, and I was just holding back from this fear of, like, becoming a dot, but I think <coughs> I needed to do it in a way that still helps the snowflaking process. And, and what got you over that to where you could do that? Uh, I mean, a lot of it was kind of working through an infection and hearing yeah. other people go through these similar experiences and, and just getting, yeah, I guess, like, yeah, I, I guess, a big, a big part of it, I think, was helpful in knowing that, like, I wasn't alone with these challenges and just seeing creative ways other people approached um, individuals on their team and asked them to kind of get involved. Yeah. But you put your finger on what is a clear tension between, you know, uh, proposing and eliciting, uh, between guiding, uh, telling. Uh, it's a different mode of working with people, and there's a balance there, and I think you described it well. It's hard for people to sort of imagine going in a direction that they've never gone before without seeing what it could be. <laughs> and I mean, and so there is this work of envisioning, it, or whether you call it creating hypotheses, or proposing ideas that that's really important for the organizer or the leader to, to do that work to do, which is not the same thing as now I'm going to tell everybody what to do. It's, 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 it's getting that distinction going and that tension, I think, is very much at the heart of this. And, yeah, back there, um, somebody, yeah, yeah, Eric, and then Tyke, yeah. Um, one thing that, that really stuck with me from the Hypex article was how he talks about um, analyzing patterns of conflict within the group and patterns of work avoidance um, to find clues about what's actually going on. And I think that's something I've really struggled with to try to, to see that the conflict uh, and the ways that my team are avoiding work or that I'm avoiding doing yeah. things, and it's, that it's not about that, it's about something bigger, and trying to, to think why, like why are we having this conflict, or why, um, are my, are my, why are, are my team members avoiding doing something? Like, is it, is it, it's not about that, it's about something else, and trying to think about that. It's been something I, I think I've been struggling with, but Getting, getting up on that balcony. Yeah. Yeah. I was curious, how many people have taken Ryan's class? Hyphen's class? Oh, it's, it, it's, a, it's a really nice compliment to this. Um, for the reason that Eric is saying. Because of its focus on how groups work. And, and sort of how to, how to appreciate sort of what's going on in these groups that we're trying to work with. So that you can be more strategic about it by diagnosing better kind of what's what's cooking 
so it, 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 it's, it, it can be a, a helpful perspective, and I, that's why I appreciate that article that, or, or that chapter that we have people to read. But a uh, type? Yeah, yeah uh, I just want to share that it was very helpful in my project to make team members aware that coordinator and uh, facilitator is just one of these roles, uh, uh, just equal, uh, equally important as uh, uh, maybe the person in charge of logistics or outreach, uh, so that I am uh, uh, asked to do these jobs that I'm not stepping out too much. Uh, but also, I am not taking this authoritative uh, uh, goal that's commanding everybody. So basically, it, it is a snowflake, but I'm facilitating. I, I, I want people uh, uh, to be uh, clear that this is just one of the roles there. Yeah. Well, yeah. I have to speak from a different perspective because what it does the whole course taught me as a person older in leadership capacity before and then coming and sitting in the classes and the sessions at first and not understanding why you're having all these challenges. What is it that's keeping you back? And you, you know you have done leadership and you're supposed to. And what is it? And then I must say coming and having a meeting Professor Gans, and in my session, I just, something just shifted. First of all, I had to say to myself when I was coming to the meeting, please, I have everything planned what I want to say, that I'm quitting because I cannot understand why I'm having all these challenges. This was like oh, maybe four or five weeks ago. And I sat there and I said, please take my ego out of the way when I step into Professor Gans' office. And just, if it is something bigger that I need to learn, just alone find the space to understand that it can really take me across the bridge. And when I came into the office and the follow-up session, it really took me across the bridge because I had to leave my ego. My ego and the fact that at my age you say, well, with all these young folks, you're supposed to know all of these things, and why is it that I have? And it really has been a whole cathartic thing for me. It's still going. It has been amazing because I don't know where it's going to take me. I am very looking forward to it because I know my role is leadership, but I needed to do so much more. And this course has really helped me. So it's going to be interesting to see at the end of the year, what will come up with it when I go back home. Because the sessions, the group, I learned so much also in the group that I never thought was possible. Mm -hmm. And it has really taken me to another place. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now, if, the, if, if we could package this, <laughs> what was it that flipped for you, though? I mean, what, what did you do? Okay. That, that, yeah. I, <laughs> I was sitting outside of your office. I had an appointment with you. Yeah. And I'm saying, no, I have all of this plan, you know. I went into my little meditation before coming to you. And I said, please, now God, just guide me. Whatever, although I may have this plan, take me to the place where you need me to go. And I stepped into your office, and I love the space. And how you handled it with me just made a shift, totally shift. I mean, my group know about it because I told them about what happened. Few persons know about it, I've shared it with them. Anybody knows about it. It just shifted. Well, I'm gonna have to debrief you and find out what I did because <laughs> 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 I did. Yeah. 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 I'm writing with this, I mean, I can't stop writing, as you are seeing. <laughs> <laughs> I'm saying, where is all of this coming from? <laughs> so but it, it sounds like you, you, you sort of made a choice to, to open yourself up to new learning. I mean, uh, which, is, which and, and learning takes courage, because it means letting go of what we know from what we don't know, right? 
And so, to, so there's this whole dimension of courage and hope and faith that's connected with actually being a learner. And you said to me, you have to unlearn to learn. And that was a, huh. I have to unlearn. <laughs> so I am unlearned. <laughs> Why, I gotta keep on learning. <laughs> 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 Julian. Um, I, I had a, a question for actually for everyone. Um, just by show of hands, how many of you guys have like put your leadership like um, team structure like on a piece of paper or like for display for your team? Like you have like roles. Like or you send the email. Um, how, have all of you guys sort of put your position first? Because I've always put my position first, but you just made me think about sort of in terms of like how people perceive like who's the leader and who's like, like if you put facilitator first all the time, like that sends like a message. Whereas like now I'm thinking like, you know, I've always put facilitator first, like why not put it like in the middle or like at the end or something like that. Mm -hmm. Just because it's like, I think that it can do something for me. When I was wondering if anyone had, had tried that. Um, it's interesting. It's interesting. Over there, yeah. Um, last night, I was actually doing a meeting with my leadership team, organizing a town hall, and it's a little peak and it's been a little different, but as I was running out the door, I was like, crap, we need roles. Uh, let's do roles, blah, 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 moderate, you know, we talked about, like, what makes a good whatever, and I was like, but what should I do? As I was running out the door, and they were like, well, we need you to do this piece. And it was totally in line with coordinating and stuff, but they got to choose what I had to do, and I was like, that's a great call. And they had already kind of assigned me that position, and I thought that was really, like, a, a piece that, that I felt really good about that, that my team knew how to use me for what I was good at, and could call that out. Mm -hmm. Are there other thoughts on Julian's question? Are there reflections on that? Who's, um, who's uh, figured out how to create tension well? You don't have to wait until it's to uh, enjoy the tension, uh, how to see the tension as constructive, how to see this tension as this great opportunity for growth, learning, and change, uh, whether it's challenging the people you're working with, challenging the people who hold authority or power, challenging yourself to confront contradictions in your own behavior. All these things are loaded with tension. This work is all about tension, I mean, and because it's about change. And, and it's also all about conflict. I mean, conflict's not a bad word. It's, it's how life works. Uh, you know, it's a question of, so I'm, I'm curious who learned to sort of embrace the conflict and love the tension. No, no I mean, I, it's, you know, there are people who that's kind of their deal, but there's a balance here that is really critical to figure out how to find your way to between the sort of life-giving, supporting, and including, and then the tension-creating, distinction-making, polarizing. Because both pieces, in, in the Jewish tradition, in Kabbalah, there's a, there's a, there, this is described as the tension between what's called chesed and gibura. And chesed is loving kindness, gibura is judgment, distinction. And it's sort of like these two different energy sources, is the way it's described, brought into relationship with each other. It's kind of, and there's a, there's actually a, a synagogue in town where they have a banner for one and a banner for the other. That week you're supposed to go in front of the one you need more of that week uh, mm -hmm. to balance kind of kind of where you are because there's a recognition of the role of both. That tension one though is a tough one, I think. 
And I mean, I take your point, Mona. I mean, the tension is there. There's no question about it. But then the question is, do we go toward it or do we run away from it? Or try to protect ourselves from it or do we figure out how to embrace it and build on it? Yeah, let me, let me see. Yeah, Mark. Well, for me, you know, it's like I'm working with a community of color. I'm part of that community, obviously. And, you know, we have to face a lot of difficulties every single day, especially in this country, coming from other countries, you know. And the way I decided to approach it was, well, you know, it's like I want to empower, I want to build capacity, you know, I want to make them feel good, you know, good about themselves. And sort of to bring, approach this in a peaceful way, but then I found that I wasn't really <coughs> getting a good response from them. And then I see other people in the community that try to work with this community and they sort of approach it in a sort of dictator way. And I see that they get a much better response from the community and that kind of makes me really mad because they're not really empowering the community, they're not building capacity. So then I thought, well, how can I find a balance between the two? And then it occurred to me, well, tension, that is a great way to put it, because if we just go with the tension that already exists in our community, you know, with the people who are creating the problem, the people who are not doing anything about it, and the people who want to do something about it, we can use that to our advantage, because that, they're already used to that, they're, that's their environment, and I think that's sort of a good tool to use for them, instead of being a dictator, I can just be like, well, this is already going on, you know, instead of trying to peacefully work with the police to solve the issues, how about we have a march and we embarrass the hell out of them and at the same time, you know, we're creating unity within the community and then they're always complaining that we don't call enough and they create a phone bank, you know, for like two or three months calling every single day, day and night to annoy the hell out of them, <laughs> you know, and that's a great way to use tension that already exists there without being a dictator. And people seem to be responding to that a lot better than me trying to be Gandhi and trying to be peaceful <laughs> and, you know. <laughs> yeah, you know. You know that's <laughs> well, that is one of the callers. The organizers have been known to be called outside agitators or inside agitators. But, you know, and then the response is an agitator in the old washing machine is what it took to get the dirt out. You know, it's kind of like, but that whole role that you're describing, the other thing that in what you're saying that I think is important is to recognize that, that conflicts that aren't visible aren't therefore not there. They're often below the surface. And because people feel powerless about them, they, they, they're, they're, not, they're not being surfaced. And often you have to surface it in order to be able to deal with it. And so it's not like creating, putting a conflict there that isn't there. You're just making visible something that is there. Now, I know that's certainly where there's enormous power inequalities. That's just so I appreciate that contribution. Yeah. Um, in my project, we're asking the, the, uh, the cardinal in Boston and the Catholic Church to support a change in the church teaching about contraception. And like in every step like that we've done, whether it's an op-ed or a personal email to the cardinal or a petition, we've had to navigate like how saying things that are challenging and also like saying them in a way that like invites cooperation and dialogue and like keeps us out of trouble because it's just like scary for people and even so like even though we really did our best to be careful about that once our petition went online like we've not had much success we were hoping for a thousand signatures we got 50 or something in our first week and um and Get, like talking to people about it, like now that my parents signed it, and even though they like support what we want to do, I talked to somebody who works in the church, um, um, in a in a petition <coughs> who signed it, and she said, you know, I signed this petition, and it was a real struggle for me to do that because I was afraid that my name would be identified and I would I might you know, lose my job, and. But it was still, I still felt really good about like standing up for what I believed in. And so like, I don't know, just all, uh, making, that made me aware, I guess, of how difficult it was for people. And like also raises a bunch of questions about everything that we've done, but, but also like makes me appreciate even the even, um, small things which are really big. For some. Are really big and it also highlights 
again, uh, to me, it highlights the significance of courage as central to this whole work. I mean, the courage to learn, but also the courage to act, to declare oneself. You know, it's risky to make change. Uh, it is. And there's no way around that, and there's no way to dodge that. I mean, it just is. And so then isn't the question then how to prepare for that and how to manage it and how to, in fact, even embrace it. Um, seems to be where a lot of the work is in this work, at least from that standpoint, in, in exercising leadership in this way. It's very different. It's different just to sort of to maintain. But you're trying to change things. You know, you're trying to take them in a different direction. There, there's always going to be risk and resistance. It's just built into it. Um, but the amazing thing that I find is the resources people have for that. See, if it's something that really matters, if it's something that really goes to a person's core values, if it's something, because we also have this need to live with dignity. And, and, and often that requires courage. And so then it sort of becomes how to, how to encourage that, you know? So that the tension then is between my expectation that I can live with dignity in the way I'm being dealt with or treated, and therefore I need to fix that. But I also have the capacity to fix it. And I don't know, I, it's, uh, it's a core issue. Uh, yeah? Oh, yeah, I was uh, kind of thinking along the lines of what was just said and also some comments. Uh, and I was just saying, as not seeing the people that you're working with, just people that, you know, oh, this is a constituency or potential member, but seeing them as also a mother or a student or, you know, and how those different identities may conflict actually with what you're trying to do and being sensitive to that. I think, you know, we can talk a lot about the dot and snowflake thing, but also remember that as I'm, you know, I can get really tunnel vision. This is me personally. Um, but there's times to let that go a little bit if in the real world, you know, someone else is just like, I, I can't see that whole thing right now, or, or being sensitive to what's actually happening. I think there were points where um, it seemed like, kind of like Sushi was saying, like, I knew what I wanted or, or I had a vision, but um, not being sensitive to how things on the ground were shifting. Yeah, it's a constant deal, though, isn't it? We I mean, always have to look at that. Um, I, I think sometimes the language of the class kind of like got me out of the reality of what was going on. Like I would see, I would start to see things almost like the Matrix, where like I was seeing little snowflakes, little, like little dots. <laughs> and, and they all have little happy faces and little dots. And yeah, and um, and I had to. Remember, It's also important to recognize, I mean, these, these conflicts um, of these different roles and different expectations we have of ourselves are within all of us. And, you know, like in, in say, in union organizing, the conflict that a person may face between um, risking their employment, right, which their family depends on, which their responsibility, perhaps as a, a breadwinner with respect to the family, is a pretty big risk to take. But then also the fact that they're modeling deference, failure to protect their own dignity, failure to stand up when it's required of them, there's tensions. And and a lot of this is aligned with, you know, different facets of a person. But those tensions are in, in us. But so when, when you're coming along and you're trying to move people in a different direction, in a certain direction, or create uh, a context in which people can choose to move in that direction, Sometimes you have to work really hard to create the choice points and the boundaries so that it's clear, I need to choose this or that. I need to take this risk or not. Because making those moments of choice real, um, yeah, nobody may want to rush toward them. But that is part of sort of galvanizing, creating a space in which people can move in a different direction. But it's never free of the kind of conflict you're describing. I, I don't think especially even in the work of organizing itself. Because it turns out that people who do organizing are human beings and have needs other than like, you know, a one-on-one -on -one meetings and have a life besides that. And sort of, you know, but 
that balance too is a critical piece of it. So thanks for bringing that out. We have, um, yeah, who? There's somebody over here. I saw somebody. No, they go away. Too much tension? Come on. Yeah. Attention, I've brought it back. All right, good, good, good. <laughs> By doing that work, it makes the other work more doable. And, and, and the other work then does tear things apart. It actually can strengthen. No, it's a great observation. I mean, the, the, you know, that little shared purpose norms exercise. Actually, if you think, I mean, if you really think deeply about what it's actually about or trying to get at, I think it's what you're describing. Uh, and, you know, uh, because then it creates a, a holding space or a context in which the other stuff can be productive in the back. Does that pose any, any issues? I yeah. oh, see. You're nodding your head. What do you think about? Well, that's a section that that is a big fear or a or wall. So the fear of not realizing <coughs> how is that um, um, can create um, can set us uh, 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 can be a wall for us to make us and to make people uh, to um, <coughs> be able to make commitment or set commitment and uh, to be forward in what you in what you want and and stop your being an upfront leader yeah. in that so. uh, Yeah, I, I think this is this, this certainly came up in section, especially the week that we talked about the walls of fear and um, fear of, of rejection, of putting yourself out there. And I think one of the things that really helped was thinking about um, like separating yourself from your project and that taking things, um, you know, when people are not interested in your project, that doesn't mean they're not interested in you or, you know, don't value you. And I think it's particularly hard when you're working with your friends or you're working with people who you have relationships with that go beyond this professional relationship that you're trying to form because you're asking them to do things or you're, um, you know, you're sort of blurring the lines. And, you know, I think one thing I realized in myself, I was like holding back um, talking to my friends about this project because I didn't want them to feel pressured that, um, that I was asking something of them if they couldn't give it, then it would reflect on our friendship poorly. And I also was afraid of 
the result of that, that if they didn't come, then, then I would feel like they didn't value my friendship, and, you know, something to that effect. Mm. Uh, but then when I put it out there, I, I, I realized that once I could separate those out, I put it out there, and, and then I felt much better about it. Yeah. How did people respond? And actually, they, like, they responded like, oh, this is great, like, really supportive, and not a lot of them could make it, but everyone was very supportive of the idea, and like, to me, that was actually the most important, to know that like, they valued me and, and that, you know, this is, these are separate things. Yeah. So, so what helps to manage some of this stuff? I mean, this tension business, the liking business, the, you know, what are ways that you've found that can help you manage these things so that they become sources of strength and not inhibition? Yeah, Eric. Well, I think one of the things I've, I've just been thinking about hearing everyone's great comments is this like old uh, like teacher quote that we would give when we're training teachers, which is when you think about kids, it's if you say, I didn't, I, a kid doesn't say, I, I, I became what I think I can. And it's not that I became what you think I can, it's I became what I think you think I can. <laughs> <laughs> And so, I, I don't know if I'm feeling like you're getting about that. <laughs> it's like, the organizing project maybe didn't become exactly what I thought it could. And it wasn't, as, it wasn't necessarily what someone else, when I explained it to them, thought it was. But it's like my perception and toying with myself and like thinking, oh, this is, you know, how do I play it safe or avoid conflict and stuff? And it becomes this, you know, larger or different thing that maybe is a good way is, is successful or not. But I think the way that I've tried to navigate that is I just see one-on-ones as an ongoing process, that it's just the ability to continue to sit down and have a coffee or break bread and be able to share about your vulnerabilities or your frustrations in a, you know, in a safe setting, but in a way that there's tension, right? Like, I didn't appreciate how you disagreed with me in the meeting, whatever it is, you know, like, mm-hmm. let's talk about it. Um, and seeing that as just an ongoing cyclical kind of core part of the work has really helped me. Uh, because I continue to play with myself with like, oh, this isn't what I think it is, or what maybe it's not what they think it is, but talking about it. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, you're creating the expectation of an ongoing dialogue, and it's a way of checking yeah. in, as well as challenging. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Coaching and checking. What else? Yeah, Martha. Well, on the part of not being liked, I see that as a good thing. Because, I mean, if everybody dislikes you, then you're probably a jerk, but if some people do not <laughs> like you, <laughs> you know, it means you're probably doing things right. If some people really show that they dislike you, that you're doing something that they feel threatened by. So it means that you're on the right track. So to me, when I'm told sometimes that I, I don't like you, it's like, all right, well, <laughs> I take it as a compliment because it means on the right, I'm on the right track. I guess it depends on who it comes from. Yeah, that too. <laughs> 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 you know, right, right, right. Other ways to manage this stuff that we talk you know, we're talking about there's a lot of emotional work here. There's a lot of interpersonal work. We can talk a lot about that. There's a lot of self-work. There is also conceptual work. I mean, there is also the, this whole conceptual, uh, the work involved in strategy, for example, of understanding power. What's a theory of change? What does that really mean? And and how to take people on a journey of understanding of, of what that means. Because it's sort of shifting context from what appears immediately obvious to to dynamics that are operating underneath or outside or over and above. And isn't that also an important part of this of this work? How many people struggle with theory of change issues? Let me see. I, that's, that's largely, conce- I mean, it isn't entirely conceptual. You know, there's an emotional content to it, no question about it, because it may mean confronting certain kind of truths that we may not want to confront. But it is also this whole thing of thinking through chains of causality thinking through chains of interdependence. I don't know, what, what have you discovered about that? that? That's another very important piece of this work. You know, we put narrative and all the heart work, but then there's the head work, you know, strategy and all the head work, and that's also a critical piece of the work. Yeah, Mona. I think that there is one big focus of the that sometimes we need to be able to see in the situation what we want to see. Yeah. So, Where 
where at some point when we do this and if it turns out to be this then that is the theory of change and if it turns out to be this then that would be the theory of change. So that we will all get together and and try to figure out what's out there really. And not putting men to stick out the lenses. And we have to to help each other to take out these lenses because everyone is putting his own lens and see in the situation what what he or she wants to see. And that's very tough. It's really interesting. I mean, you're, you're proposing a kind of uh, Roberto Unger at the, at the uh, law school talks about something he calls democratic experimentalism. Yeah. But or John Dewey writes about. I mean, you're describing. Well, it's all hypothesis testing. And so, you know, so, well, this might be it, so let's figure out, let's try this, and then let's assess and see what worked, what didn't work, and then see from that we can go on and make some conclusions. That, that's pretty interesting. I mean, a lot of times, the way people arrive at tactics, you remember how we, uh, about the orange hats? People try things, and then you see what works, and then you learn from it. So this, this learning, it's not just the learning about the heart, it's also learning about what works in the world, and, and the way you're observing <coughs> And part, I mean, one reason I'm a nut in organizing campaigns on numbers. <laughs> I mean, like, like how many people came to the meeting? Like, you know, who, who turned out all the people? Who didn't? It's not. A, it's trying to get at the data to be able to translate that data into learning about what's working in this context or that context. So it's very much about trying to understand that aspect of things, and 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 sometimes that gets lost in the process. I, I appreciate the way you describe that, because it is a kind of ongoing learning about how the world works. That's important to share. Other, other thoughts on that? Yeah. I also think what Eric mentioned before about um, conceptualizing um, things in terms of what people would be receptive to, what people will want to do, is important in terms of the head work, because I certainly found myself coming in trying to figure out what people would be receptive to, and then realize that was very quickly that's basically a marketing exercise. You're trying to pick, figure out what people want and then give it to them as uh, opposed to what they need to do, which is what Heinz talks about yeah. in terms of showing people work that they don't want to do. And that whole idea of work affordance, I think, really resonates there because that's when you might risk becoming unpopular because you're the person pointing at the thing in the room that nobody wants to talk about. And so I think conceptually understanding how that works, even though it comes back to self, just rationalizing the way that all comes together is really it's interesting the way you put it, too. It's also the difference between transactional and transformational work, mm -hmm. because the transactional stuff is all about existing preferences and exchanges based on that. A lot of this work is about discovering new new ways of looking at things, which requires engaging people in such a way that, again, that there's learning that isn't just on the surface. No, it's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a really good observation. I think that's a nice connection. Yeah. Um, And it's using a cognitive exercise to get at something even deeper. The recognition of worth and value, as well as the quote resources. If I understand. Yeah. yeah. No, that's that's a, that's an easy. Um, there's a lot of stuff here, and I hope you'll think about this more because you have had a semester struggling with these things, experimenting with these things, and the whole thing's been an experiment, right? And 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 you know, with a lot of data. <laughs> I mean, a lot of it's both internal and external experience from which to, to learn and process. A few things that, that, that um, 
jump out to me about this uh, this work. Um, one is is appreciating um, your own power. Um, and I, I mean, I think it's uh, it's pretty easy these days to kind of lose sight of that uh, because everything seems so large and so macro and so global and so institutionalized and so that it's sort of like um, so yeah so where's where's my source of efficacy here and. I mean, if you really don't think about um, what actually influences us, you know, uh, I don't know the last time you made a life choice based on something that appeared through an app advertisement or <laughs> something, a piece of mail you got or, you know, maybe even a TV commercial. But if you think about um, the influence other people have in your lives, uh, you know, sometimes it's momentary. Sometimes people enter your life at points in which you're making decisions, you're in transition. And, and you know, if you really think about the important choices, you're going to find most of the time some other person there, uh, uh, you know, maybe a parent, a spouse, a lover, a, a clergy person, a teacher, uh, someone there that interacted with you. And what this organizing is about is about harnessing that fundamental power, that sort of power of relationship and, and influence that we have with each other and try to harness that, focus it uh, as a source of power. So I, I don't think you go too far with this unless you really get that about, about yourself and other people and kind of how we, how we work. Uh, the second thing is that uh, this is something in which uh, values really matter, <laughs> or values and beliefs. Uh, it's hard to fake it. Uh, you know, you can. I mean, some people have, do, but it's pretty hard. Um, Again, it's, it's like not like producing a TV commercial. It's not like producing a marketing brochure. You know, then it goes out and does its thing. Because, you know, this is about people presenting themselves to other people. And we're making judgments all the time about authenticity, about sincerity, about what's real, what isn't real in this. And so it's kind of hard to fake. And, and, and some of the things that really matter, I think, are first, it's kind of what I was saying, uh, belief in yourself. I mean, appreciation that you as a person have an enormous contribution to make to other people. You can, you, you actually can make a difference in the world, not in some flaky way, but in, 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 in a real way. That what you have is of worth and of value. Because it, it, to come, unless you come from that, it's really hard for other people to get from you belief in themselves. You know, it, it makes sense. It's sort of, so, so getting your own stuff straight. <laughs> Very, very important here. But the second thing is about people and other people. And when I was learning organizing, I asked Fred Ross, who trained a lot of us in organizing, what do you have to do to be a great organizer? He said, well, uh, you got to like people. I said, oh, God, I like people. I have no problem. <laughs> no, he said, that's not what I mean. Uh, it's like uh, when they don't show up, uh, when they say they're going to do it and they don't, uh, when things go wrong and they blame you, uh, when on and on, and he went down the whole list. So that's what I mean. It's like understanding how human beings, how we are, and that, you know, we struggle. And, and appreciating that whole sort of tragic comedy, or however you want to think of it, uh, you'll get very good at this stuff if, if you get that. You know, where it's not like constantly being disappointed, oh, they let me understand. This is kind of the humanity we are. And, and um, belief in the, in, the, in the organization or the project, whatever it is you're really doing, it's got to be real for you. And, you know, because people pick up on that or they don't. Uh, I think a sense of hopefulness about the future is crucial. And I don't mean optimism. And I don't mean sort of flowers in May. I mean a sense of possibility. And we've talked about before. Very hard to engage other people in shaping the future if there's no sense that the future holds possibility. It holds promise. As discouraging as it may look at different times. And this work. You know, that there's real value in it. So there's some things that I think are important to be clear about. That's one. But besides values and beliefs, there's respect for the work. Um, you know, in, 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 in certainly in some ways, this kind of work, and I don't mean just, you know, community work, this kind of work um, is, is a calling. 
you know, more than it's a career or a job. It's sort of like something that, through which you bring meaning into the world and gives meaning to you, and, and it's, it's, it's a vocation in that sense, a calling. Um, but it's also a craft. I mean, it's a craft. It's a serious craft. It's like uh, you can be really good at it or really lousy. <laughs> there's discipline involved. There's, there's, there's measures of excellence. There's professionalism. You know, the detail involved in knowing where to stand to pass out leaflets strategically in front of a store, believe it or not, there is an enormous amount of detail in that. And there's something about love for those kinds of details that brings excellence. I mean, it's, you know, whether it's a detail of the law or a detail of music or a detail, it's, it's really appreciating that excellence is in mastery of all that. Not as a burden, not as a hassle, but like, ooh, that's cool. That's what brings out the value of, uh, of what we're doing. And uh, so, you know, it means mentoring. It means coaching. It means ongoing learning if you really want to master any of these tools. Any of these, these skills involved here, but it's taking them seriously, and then, and then there's, uh, and then it's an art, <laughs> uh, because then there's the creative dimension that kind of transcends the craft, when it's really cool. And I was so mad at that Chavez movie because it missed completely the artistry in Caesar's work, in the creativity that he brought to the work of organizing farm workers in in the kinds of uh, tactics and strategy and just the imagination involved there that goes beyond simple professionalism to real creativity. And we, we're talking about shaping the future. It is all about creativity. It's all about creativity and, and imagination. So there is the art. Um, respect for yourself. Um, I mentioned belief in yourself, but there's also this whole question of taking care of what you need to take care of to be able to do the work. And there's a couple of dimensions to that. Most of us need some form of accountability and some form of support. Uh, I think we really get into trouble when we lose accountability. When, if, if we wind up in a situation where nobody around will call us on our stuff, uh, because for power reasons or whatever the reasons, we're, we're in trouble. Uh, we need people you know, letting us know, this is what's happening. This is what I'm seeing. In, in a way that, that we can then respond to, but then we also need the, I'm here for you. Constructing that space. Now, I'm talking now about professional space. I think it's really crucial. <laughs> I know when I've performed best and learned best, it's been under those circumstances, and we had kind of both of those, of those aspects of it. But then there's the, the needs that enable you to live your life. And, you know, you may have detected, I don't know, in some of the readings, uh, a little bit of a macho, uh, I don't know if you saw an Alinsky or Caesar stuff. I mean, you know, this, some of this was written at a time when organizers were mostly men. There was an expectation, I mean, official organizers, mostly men. There was an expectation there would be this spouse at home taking care of everything. And, you know, that world's gone and, and good riddance. But it, it means that the whole way of how we uh, take care of ourselves it's not a taken for granted deal. It's kind of, you've got to figure it out. And I struggle with it. I, everybody I know in this work struggles with it. But unless you have the life that includes your partners, that includes your faith, or includes whatever it is that gives you juice and energy, uh, you run out of it. You run out of it. And, and you wind up, it, it, it winds up not being even good for the work uh, because you get empty. You become kind of hollow. And so how to, how to create that, I think, this is a particular challenge that people are struggling with as roles are changing in society, and I think it's a good struggle, but it means figuring that piece out. And, um, and you know, I, I think Ronnie's piece is very, very good, you know, about the sort of balcony dance floor and sort of maintaining that. The last thing I just want to say about the respect for self, the work, your beliefs, your power. Uh, I call it the desire to win. Um, you know, when you engage with people in a common project that's about changing things that matter to them, you've you got a responsibility to win. <laughs> and maybe that's not popular, everything's supposed to be win-win, I, I don't know, or, whatever, or winning doesn't matter. No, it does matter. It makes a huge difference if you win the campaign, if you get the law passed, if you change this whole practice that's been abusive of people. It matters enormously. And so that 
piece of it is a con I think of it as a contract we make with people that we're going to work with that, hey, th we're all in this. This really matters. And that's kind of, so, you know, as when I was first introducing this class, a lot of this for me is summed up in those Hillel questions, which I'll just say again, probably in my heart. Uh, the, uh, if I am not for myself, who will be for me? And we just got through talking about a bunch of different facets of self and what it means to be for yourself, to really be for yourself. If I am for myself alone, what am I? And we've been talking a lot about that whole aspect of it, negotiating the relational, that whole relational dimension that really enables us to become what we can become. And the, if not now, when? This, this need to act, to get into action, not to find ways to push it away or whatever, but to actually get into the action. So I hope that's some of the stuff you can take from this. Um, and we've got a few minutes here for takeaways. So what are some takeaways from the discussion today? I feel like I just gave a little closing sermon here. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> benediction or something. So you have some reflections over here. Yeah, Mark? Sorry, I know I talked a lot today, but um, I like that I was able to find a word to my ha moment, which is, Tension and being disliked, you know, is part of the territory and it doesn't have to be something negative. It can actually be a tool that can be used to accomplish great things. Okay. Okay. Other observations? interesting because I get what you're saying. I'm curious about why it works that way. Other, other reflections, observations? Okay. Yeah, I mean. Mine is a tension one, but different. Like internal tension, not with the other side, but like in your group. Like particularly what you said about people are going to let you down. And like you are going to have to have difficult, not fun. Like people, people you like are not going to like you sometimes <laughs> in the work you do. And then you want to do it for more than eight weeks, you have to like, Challenging, isn't it? <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.